Hello to anyone watching this. So a couple months ago I played through Persona 4 and it was the most lovely experience I have ever had with a game. Like literally everything about it, from its setting to its gameplay to its just overall design was so perfectly charming. But of course the heart of the game is its characters and the heart of those characters are their social links. These very intimate and for the most part incredibly written stories between the protagonist and another character provide the best moments in the game for me personally. So I think the best way to pay tribute to them is to subjectively rank them all. So today I just wanted to put all of the social links in a line from worst to best simply based on how much I enjoyed spending time with them and how eager I was to see the next part of their story. But also, of course, just on how much I enjoyed the characters themselves. You know, I think that's going to be the biggest factor in all of this. And since I am a human being with, you know, life experiences, I'm going to see all of these characters in a different way to everyone else, like something that someone could find quite charming about a character I could find quite annoying, you know, this is quite a deeply personal list for anyone to make, but I'm going to try my best to explain why I enjoy each of these characters, even if it's not a reason someone else would. And of course, there are going to be heavy spoilers for the game. Just the way that I'm going to discuss everyone is going to be quite free-flowing, and I'm not going to be too specific about each of their social link stories, because I'd rather just talk about how I found their characterization, you know? But I just hope that you can get something from the way that I describe everything and everyone, if that makes sense any sense. Also I'm going to be talking about all of these characters as if you've already played the game and have experienced all of their stories because I just feel more comfortable talking about them in that way. So if you've never played Persona 4 this really is not going to be the best jumping on point to start to understand it. So with all the necessary disclaimers out of the way let's just get on with it because I'm definitely going to be needing to do a lot of explaining for my bottom pick, being Chie. It's like, I can always appreciate a peppy bitch, but it's like, from the moment she started speaking, I found her to be so grating. Just her attitude and her constant shouting just got on my nerves so much. Like, I think this screenshot says it all. Like, I had absolutely no interest in actually following her social link. And when I did, I just felt absolutely nothing. Like, there was just nothing compelling about what was happening with her, you know? And it's like, as soon as Kanji joined, Chie was out of the party. She was out of my mind. She just contributed absolutely nothing positive to the game for me. I'm aware that I'm being extremely harsh towards her, it's just... I can't help but find her annoying. She's just so loud to the point of abrasiveness and I really hate that in characters, so... I just struggled the entire time to get much enjoyment out of her and... Especially when the other first introductory girl is Yukiko. It's like, there's no comparison really, I just don't want to spend my time with her. So that's everything that I wanted to vent about her. Uh, if that felt kind of hollow and slightly out of touch, it's because I didn't want to get in touch with her, you know? So let's move on from the character that made me feel the most angry to the character that made me feel the most apathy with Sayoko. I feel like this is the best time to note that I've only played Golden. Um, I've heard whisperings about the absolute state of her social link in the original game, 
which I've refused to fully look into for personal reasons. But purely based on what we got in Golden, I just can't bring myself to feel much towards her. Like I'm probably missing something, but to me her story just came across as her being flirty for a few ranks, her being depressed for a few ranks, and then just buggering off to a different hospital and that's it. It just felt like the protagonist wasn't really an active participant in the story, you know, everything was just sort of happening off screen and he was just caught in the crossfire, you know? The only real positive I can say about this social link is that it branches off into Hisano's social link. So now we can move on to the characters that I genuinely enjoyed, starting with Margaret. I think in terms of being a Velvet Room attendant, she did absolutely everything that she needed to. She was mysterious, but at the same time kind of cool auntie-ish, you know, you just want to get to know her more, even though you never really get the opportunity to. And I think that's my only real issue with her, you know, I felt like I didn't get to know her as much as I wanted to. Like, I did appreciate her constant phone calls during the third semester, but they didn't really expand on her character that much, you know? And before you ask, I really don't feel like playing the entire game again, doing pretty much everything 100%, just to get a really tough boss battle with her that may expand on her character. So yeah, like I said, I really enjoyed all that we got, I just simply wish there was more and because of that I can't really put her any higher. But moving on, we have a character who definitely gave us all that he could, being the Fox. Like I definitely can't justify putting him any higher than this, but the moment that the social link forming screen came up with him was one of my absolute favourite moments in the game, so I just have to give him credit for that, just the absolute absurdity of this actually being a character that you can get to know. And I was always compelled to fulfil all of the emas and help the wishing shrine become as good as it possibly can. It's just quite a few of those emas were needlessly tedious, like they take place over so many days that I just ended up forgetting to do them for weeks at a time and by the time I got around to doing them I didn't care about them as much so that could have been handled a bit better but it's not the fox's fault that people's issues are hard you know and I really loved the potentially unintentional humor in the fact that he just sort of tags along into the TV world and basically no one mentions it like he's just there for the vibes you know you can't help but love him Next is Marie, who, while I can definitely understand why very few people see her as a golden child, if you will, I still found quite a lot of enjoyment out of her story. Like, I am personally a fan of a lot of the tropes of a fish out of water story, and I genuinely appreciated how her social link was basically just giving her a guided tour of Inaba, like, I found it really endearing that I got to show her around an area that I'm only just getting used to myself, if that makes sense. And even though it felt like her bond with the rest of the team was slightly exaggerated, it did still make sense that they would want to make some connection with her, given that I, as the protagonist, was making a strong connection with her. It's just her integration into the third semester that slightly made her feel completely worthless as a character. Like, I really don't understand why there needed to be an extra layer to all of the gods that were playing a part in the overall story. Like, I did appreciate the mystery of trying to find out where she went over that semester. It's just when you find out, it sort of dawns on you that especially considering that she was an additional character for an upgraded version of the game, that there was just no real need for this sort of extra component to the story. 
But the biggest contention that a lot of people have with her is just how confrontational she is. And while I do get it, like, you really don't feel like her character progresses much throughout her social link in that regard. I do think it makes sense because she's going through a lot, you know? She has no real reason to trust anyone because she just doesn't even know what she is, let alone why she's where she is, you know? So yeah, for me, some parts of her make sense while others don't, and overall, they definitely could have stuck the landing better with her, but I still do appreciate what we got and especially seeing her become a weather girl at the end of the game was really sweet. So I was personally able to accept the fact that she was constantly lashing out because I knew I was still helping her along and that was what was important to me, the fact that she was making progress in some way even if she couldn't admit it, so I was just able to look past all of that in the end. Next we have the first of two split path social links for the Sun Arcana and because I preferred drama over music as a subject in school I picked Yumi and I think I'm glad I made that choice like I didn't dislike her story but at the same time it did feel like it was dragging its heels at plenty of points you know it felt like a good few ranks were wasted on her just crying at the hospital rather than fully expanding on her family situation and how it's affecting her. And while the story is allowed to do whatever it wants and the family drama is compelling, it's simply not the drama I signed up for. Like, I thought it would just be, oh no, who's going to play Romeo in our production of Romeo and Juliet? And I know that's probably a shallow way of looking at it, but I sort of felt misled at a point when I realised she was never going to be asked to actually turn up at Drama Club again once all of the hospital stuff started. And even when she does reappear at Drama Club, it's so weighed down by sadness and the inevitable need to find meaning to her love of acting that it just didn't really compel me, you know? So yeah, while I do get what they were going for with her and the story that we got is perfectly compelling and I was always interested in seeing where it went, like I said, it just dragged its heels and it felt like the time could have been much better utilised, so that's the reason that she's the lowest ranked school social link. Next is Shu, who I'd definitely call the most average quality wise out of all of the social links, which obviously I don't mean that in a bad way at all. He just had a perfectly endearing story that I enjoyed following from start to finish. There were just no real extra good standout moments to it, apart from maybe his birthday party, but obviously that was carried by the rest of the team rather than Shu himself. The only other real highlight was meeting up with him on the final day and hearing that he's befriended a transfer student. Like, that's the sort of simple character progression that I really love to see, so there was just really nothing else they could do with him in the nicest way possible, basically. Next is I, who might be slightly unfairly ranked down due to the fact that on several different levels I'm unable to appreciate her romance-based storyline. But I still enjoyed a lot of other aspects of her story, like from her first rank where she's just bossing you around the shopping centre, I just knew I was in for a wild ride and that's exactly what I got. I just really loved how pretty much every single rank changed the direction of her character. You know, I could tell she was trying to find herself, so I wanted to do all I could to help. Just obviously I didn't think it would lead up to her threatening to jump off the school. And even though after that moment it doesn't really feel like much else happened with her, 
Probably because I went for the normal friendship route rather than the doomed lovers route. I still just really enjoyed spending time with her, you know? I feel like this sort of story is pretty much necessary in a high school setting like this, and I really think they stuck the landing with her. Just if any of the social links were going to integrate the mechanic of easily reversing ranks by accidentally picking the wrong dialogue choice, it just makes sense that that would be with the popular girl, you know? I feel like this was perfectly executed for what it was. Next is Naoto, who, even though she's my second least favourite party member due to the fact that I wasn't really engaged with her social link, I still think she's a perfectly fun character. Like, her character arc leading up to her joining the party was just so interesting and well developed. Like, I think I wanted her to face her other self more than anyone else in the party. And the actual reveal of her being her was executed so perfectly. Like, the way they explained it was just kind of emotional in a way, you know? It was just so clear what she was. You know, there's just no way anyone could twist it to promote their unrelated interests. It just felt so nice to have her in the party, you know? It's just a shame that after that moment it was quite clear there was nothing else that the developers really wanted to do with her. Like her social link is just some wild goose chase to unmask a thief that just turns out to be her grandfather making sure that she's investigating for the right reasons like I don't care about that I just want to get to know her not her grandfather. Just yeah, it kind of felt like she peaked before you even got to her social link, which is why she isn't higher, but don't get it twisted, I still absolutely loved her as a character. Next is Teddy, who is helped a lot by the fact that I played Persona 4 after 5, meaning that as the group's weird, otherworldly, animal-based helper, he's simply not Morgana. You know, he's helped by the fact he's not Morgana, basically. Don't worry, I'm not just gonna take this as an opportunity to purely slag off Morgana. I just really loved how much Teddy felt like a breath of fresh air with how he consistently was optimistic about the investigation and always wanted to help out the team. And the reveal of his not exactly bear-like human form was such an incredible moment, not just because of the opportunities that it opened up for him to follow around the group, but because of how much it added to the mystery of who he was, you know? I found that to be really compelling, you know, him trying to figure himself out as much as everyone else. He was just such a genuinely interesting character to keep up with, and I really love that. My only issue with him is the fact that he's an automatic rank up social link. Like I don't think automatic rank ups are inherently bad and the conversations that you have with Teddy leading up to them are just as engaging as any other. It's just when the actual rank up happened it always felt really jarring. Like I know this is entirely on me for forgetting that he automatically ranks up but Whenever it happened, I was just slightly like, oh, we're doing this, and just kind of moved on. Like, it kind of felt like it didn't have the impact it was meant to, for me at least. But that's my only real problem with him, and it's not even something that properly comes to mind when I think about him. You know, he'll always just be an endearing little guy to me. Next is Adachi, who, even though I'm not really able to appreciate him in the same way as others, he was still a really compelling antagonist. Full disclosure, just like pretty much everyone who played the game after its release week, I went in knowing that Adachi was the killer, and I think that honestly helped with my enjoyment of him. Like, knowing that everything he was doing was a facade, and seeing just how far he was going 
to make himself look like an incompetent fool. It just, you know, it made me shake my fist and think, ooh, you rotten little bitch. And that was of course helped by his social link, which I'm so glad was added into Golden because it just added an extra layer to how messed up he was, knowing that there were people trying to reach out to him and trying to make him feel more accepted, but he just pushed them away. Like all of his main characterization is so incredible, I just think the reason that I didn't enjoy him as much as others is because I simply wouldn't have been able to guess that he was the killer if I didn't already know. Like I think the only possible thing that would have tipped me off is his line during Nanako's kidnapping where he's like, oh well I couldn't have possibly driven to go pick her up, I don't even have a car. And the only reason I remember that line now is because, like I said, I knew he was the killer. So when he said this, I was like, oh, you do have a car, don't you? Don't you? Yeah. And while in his social link, there are obviously a couple lines hinting towards his general discontent, they just weren't anything that would have alerted me. Like, everyone has issues in this game, you know? He's no different to anyone else in that regard. So yeah, while I enjoyed everything about him before and after the reveal, I just feel like the reveal itself could have been better executed. You know, that's the only thing keeping him from being higher. Next is Naoki, who I think above all else, I can just appreciate for giving a proper aftermath to Saki's death. Like, that was one of the major hooks at the start of the game, and I was really hoping we'd be able to see how it truly affected the community, so to get a chance to interact with the victim's brother, I think was a very smart move by the developers. And even though his story is quite simple, just sort of helping him through the grieving process, I think that being able to talk to him now and then helped really reground the story, you know, while you're running through all of these fantasy dungeons, there are real people who have felt real consequences with all of the events going on. So yeah, even though I do slightly find things like the fact that the protagonist is the first person to honestly talk to him since the death of his sister to be on the verge of cliché, I still really love what they did with him in the end. Next is the second split root social link for the Strength Arcana. And since I prefer Mario Hoops over Mario Strikers, I went for Koo. And I'm really glad I made that choice because this was a really nice social link, you know? Especially compared to Yumi, I really loved how his love of basketball actually played a part in his story in multiple different ways. I just really loved the progression from him seeing basketball as a righteous escape from his family to seeing it as a sign of things changing in his family. I just found that to be really natural and interesting. And how it all led to him to trying to find answers from his orphanage only to realise that they can't give him any, it just felt so well-rounded as a story between drama and just wanting to shoot some hoops. Another thing I really love is how the social link character of the club that you didn't choose is still a massive part of the story, you know, you really get to feel how much Dezook cares about Ku. Like, I appreciated how in some ranks, when Ku doesn't really feel like talking, that you get to interact with Dezook instead and see how he's feeling and still get a grasp of how Ku's doing through him. It felt like a really natural way to keep progressing the story. So yeah, I really don't have any issues with his social link. I simply think the ones above him were executed even better. Next is Eri, who does have one of the simpler stories out of everyone, but I just think it's done so endearingly that I can't help but love it. 
I think what I like the most about this one is how it feels like there's a lot of off-screen progression to it. It's like, it really works with the fact that you can only work at the daycare three times a week, so naturally there's going to be a good bit of distance between some of your meetings with her. And I really appreciate how it goes both ways, like, sometimes she's really optimistic about Yuta and sometimes she's really pessimistic, but every single time you know she just wants the best for him. I know that's quite a specific thing to focus on, but it's just what comes to mind when I think about this link. But that's not to put down Eri herself, I find her to be really endearing at points with just how focused she is on getting Yuta to like her, and I find how the story ends to be really satisfying, you know? She'll never be the perfect mother, but she can always do her best. I just think this was a really sweet story, with my favourite part definitely being giving Eri the intel that Yuta likes Featherman R so that she can buy a DVD for him and that that actually works to bring them together. It's just small victories like that that really make it all feel worth it. And even though Yuta could be kind of annoying at points, the way they explain his lashing out did make sense in the end and it just made me want to help them even more and I think that's the best thing that a social link like this can do. Just make you want to see the next part just for the sake of seeing how their relationship develops. Next is Yosuke, the first party member to properly utilise the medium of a social link. Which is good because outside of that I don't really have much of an opinion on him, like he was a supportive bro character who wanted the best for the team but apart from the occasional slice of homophobia that I'm kind of into, there didn't seem to be much else to him. But then I went through his social link and I grew to adore him. Just the way that he opens up about how much he needed the protagonist in his life, I just found to be so real. And of course, seeing how much he starts to resent his position at Juness after Saki's death was so interesting to see, and I really started to root for him, just wanting to get the most out of his life. You know, I wanted to absolutely smack up those bratty cows who constantly kept pestering him. And it of course all culminates in his rank 10, which at first I didn't really understand, but as I got to the end game and eventually the final day, I really understood what it was going for, you know? Like I really didn't want to punch him, but when I started to understand that this is just how he best puts across his emotions at this point in his life, I felt really sympathetic towards him. So yeah, even though I don't think he's the best Persona bro character, I still just really appreciate what they were going for with him. He felt like he really stepped away from the traditional bro archetype after a while and I really like that. Next is Yukiko, who just feels a bit more well-rounded in terms of characterization in and out of her social link. Like, even though she can feel like a pretty standard reserved girl who has a really wild side, I like what they did to vary it up. It feels like she's very self-aware about the fact that she's really reserved, and I really appreciate that, because it feels like you can get to the core of her character a lot quicker than if she kept up a wall for a really long time. Like, I always found it really endearing when she broke into hysterics whenever Teddy whipped out the joke glasses. But of course, we find out a lot more about her through her social link, which even though the overall story being about the heir to a company not being so sure about if they want to take it up can also feel a bit standard, I really like what they did with it. Like, instead of her wanting to completely distance herself from it, she 
learns to embrace it and understand why it's so important, it feels like a really good subversion that feels right for her character. I feel like there's no real specific thing that I can point to as to why I enjoyed her so much. I just feel like she was so grounded in a way that I could really get behind, you know? Next is Hisano, who is partly this high because she obviously has a really engaging story, but she's mostly this high because she was the first social link that made me cry. Just the fact that you spend so many ranks with her where she's convinced that she's deaf, only for her to eventually open up and tell you that her husband simply had an incurable disease, it just got to me. Like, I really felt I could connect with her in a obviously grandmotherly kind of way. But even away from the emotional aspect of her story, I really liked how between some of the social links you had to run off to the metal workshop in order to grab a letter that she accidentally sold off with all of her other belongings. It just sort of, at least to me, gave her story an extra sense of realism, like she needed these things to jog her memory and I just really appreciated that even though it was simple, you know, just talk to the metal workshop owner and you get the letter, it still just gave an extra layer of depth to her story. And I also like how you don't have to spend any time with her outside of her ranking up, and how all of your dialogue options don't contribute any bonus points towards your relationship. I think that's quite realistic with an older person like this, like you basically just have to listen to them. Anything other than that just doesn't matter. And I really like in that way how they took the mechanic of interacting with them in a certain way to make them feel better and just flipped it on its head, you know? The social link where it doesn't matter, it actually doesn't matter, you know? I know I'm completely rambling at this point, but I just think this is an extremely special social link that deserves all the praise it can possibly get. Like. The fact that you unlock this through the devil social link actually gives that one a sense of purpose. Like, what doesn't this social link do? Next is Risei, who, while I can definitely understand why people would find her the inferior female party member of this game, I just found her to be incredibly endearing. Like, from the moment that you meet her for the first time where she's completely open to discussing the Midnight Channel to when she actually joins the party and is just an incredibly entertaining navigator and how she's constantly obsessing over the protagonist. I just found her to be so much fun personally. And in terms of her actual social link, I really appreciate how grounded it is that she doesn't inherently want to run away from the idle lifestyle. She just wants to find her own reasons to participate in it, like, I think that's quite a good way to go about it, personally, and it's a great subversion on the normal tropes where someone can just give up the pop star life cold turkey and be completely fine. I just think pretty much every aspect of her character and story just work, like, literally the only possible criticism I can have about her is how useless her early forms of enemy weakness tracking are. You know, apart from that, she's just incredible to me. Next is Nanako, which obviously it's incredibly easy to make a seven-year-old girl an incredibly likeable character, but the extra lengths they went to make her just so sweet, I just absolutely adore. Like, all she wants is for her household to be a better place, and I just want that for her, you know? Every single time Dojima had to work a night shift, I genuinely felt upset just seeing how sad it made Nanako, you know? And I really love how her social link portrays every possible up and down her relationship with her father could have at that age. 
especially the rank where she runs away really hit hard for me you know I'm glad that it wasn't drawn out and that you just quite easily found her and could just console her and let her know that things are going to get better just I was so honoured by the end of the game to be called her big bro you know I think that was quite clearly the aim with her overall character and they just stuck the landing so perfectly with it you know next is Dojima which even though I just spent some of the last part bashing him as a father I just think he's a ever so slightly more engaging character to keep up with there's just something about the workaholic father trope that I've always really sympathized with and want to see improved so actually getting the chance to do that myself I just really appreciate it and I really love how you do this through his social link you know every single rank peels back a layer to understanding why he is such a workaholic like obviously you could guess that his wife was killed but the way that that actually links back to his work is really emotional you know it really hits hard you know you want to see him solve the case but you want him to be at home you know it's not the most complex dilemma in the world but it's still one that's really engaging to follow and this was also the only other social link to make me cry like his rank 10 hits so hard you know you can genuinely feel the difference that you've made to him and it's just incredibly emotional to me. So yeah, even though his story does fall into quite a lot of cliche tropes, I just think it stuck the landing so perfectly that I can't help but love it. Plus, you know, Dojima's a complete dilf. Like, that really helps a lot for me. But now it's time for me to gush about my absolute favourite character in this game. The man, the myth, the legend, Kanji. Like, obviously I find his general struggles with masculinity to be an extremely relatable topic for me, but my appreciation for him goes so much deeper than that. Like, he's one of those characters with a really hard exterior and a soft interior and I'm a complete sucker for that sort of thing and the way that they go about that through his social link I just loved so much. Like, all that this man wants to do is make nice plushies for the people that he loves and just for anyone who wants them and that's like the sweetest thing possible you know every single rank in his social link I just utterly adored because it was just so wholesome like obviously there's more to his social link about his delinquent nature but it got to a point that that didn't really matter to me because I'd already seen through to who he truly was and you know, that's obviously the main theme of this game, so the fact that I could so clearly identify that with him, I really liked. Just everything about him appeals to my love of soft-centred men, you know? I just really appreciated that there was a character like this in a game about finding yourself, and I just wanted to save him, you know? until I actually saw what saving him entailed and I just completely regretted everything that I did in the game. So yeah, that's all of the characters covered. Just Persona 4 is such a special game to me, especially on a character level, so I'm just really glad that I was able to take the opportunity to just go on and on about how much I loved pretty much everybody. And like, I know that I'm only able to explain my appreciation of these characters through my interpretation of them, which even I can't comprehend sometimes, but I just hope that through watching this, there was at least one character that you could in some way understand more now that I've explained how I like them, if that makes any sense. 
But yeah, if you have any questions or concerns, do let me know. Just, I haven't gotten round to playing the Persona 4 spin-off games yet, so I do deeply apologise that they weren't taken into consideration here and that I may have missed a part in Arena Ultimax where Chie becomes an actually tolerable character. Uh, but bye bye, have a nice day.